Okay, hi everybody. This is Joseph P. Farrell. We are back. As you can see, this scene has slightly changed behind me. Uh, I'm in smaller, cheaper quarters and uh, getting settled, but we are back on our normal schedule of news and views from the Nefarium. And this is, of course, Thursday, July 5th in the year of the apocalypse 2012. I hope everybody had a good 4th of July yesterday in spite of the direction that the country that we're supposed to be celebrating is headed in, which isn't good. Perhaps that'll be a commentary on another day. But the big news this week, as far as I'm concerned, was the announcement by scientists at CERN that they had found footprints that were strongly suggestive signatures of the Higgs boson. And I want to comment about that on several respects and do so on the basis of a little article that I will link here from Natural News. Because the article raises several very interesting points about some of the holes or some of the parts of the standard model of physics that are puzzling and some of the implications that that standard model implies. And in commenting on it, I want to point people in the direction of some of my books because I've been talking about what I think is the ultimate formally explicit mathematical basis of some things that they need to be looking at. All right? Now, Natural News says this, and I apologize for reading this, everybody, but I'm going to have to so that you can know what I'm commenting on. As I say, I'll link this article. Under a section that says, the quest for particles, parenthesis, while ignoring consciousness, close parenthesis, why would anyone want to spend a few billion dollars smashing, <coughs> pardon me, smashing atoms together and analyzing the results of the splatter to find out what atoms are made of, of course. But more importantly, <coughs> pardon me, to find out what the universe is made of. That's what CERN is all about. And as long as its results are understood in the proper context, it's valuable science, close quote. Now, let's, let's stop and think about that. There's an interesting analogy that I want to use that a friend of mine, Paulo Trapanesa, posted on Facebook when I first posted the articles about the Higgs boson. And it happens to be an analogy. I don't know if, if it's original to him or not, but it's an analogy I like. It's an analogy I've thought about many times myself, about what physicists are doing in these particle accelerators, smashing particles together. Essentially what they're doing is it would be analogous to taking two mechanical clocks and spinning them in a track in opposite directions and smashing them together, causing a collision, splitting the clocks apart so that they can examine what the clocks are made of. All right. Now, the problem here is, is the clock is an integrated instrument. Gears and springs and so on, when they're apart, may not tell you how they fit together. All right. And the other problem is, smash the clocks into each other hard enough and a gear, a component piece like a gear, might have split or teeth might have been knocked off the gear. You'd end up with debris of gear teeth without understanding that it may go on something bigger, that it's nothing significant in and of itself. This is precisely, I think, one of the problems with the standard model. It could be, in other words, that in their mathematical predictions, they're predicting certain types of particles. And one of the things that you'll notice, those of you who are, are familiar with quantum mechanics, is that they're almost to the point of predicting a particular particle for a specific set of interactions of forces or physical interactions. In other words, for this given set 
of physical interactions, we have to have a particle creating it. So in other words, this is why you see the multiplication of particles. So number one, we have a philosophical problem. Are they really discovering things in these atom smashers, or are they creating them? And then saying, oh look, these, are, these signatures are fulfillments of our equations. I suspect that the truth is somewhere between the two. Now, let's continue in this article. I apologize for my sinus, folks. Uh, it's been fine until just late last night. <laughs> so, anyway, let me continue with this little article from Nature News because now we're getting to the rub of not so much what I think is wrong with the standard model. There are problems with it. Most physicists will agree that there's problems with it. But with what I see as the great challenge for 21st century science, particularly the physical sciences, all right, because as we're going to see now, there is a direct coupling to something else. Let me continue reading the article. What's important to realize in all this is that even the so-called standard model of explaining everything is currently an unsatisfactory patchwork of equations and mathematical transformations that don't play well together when it comes to different physical contexts such as really small things, quantum mechanics, or really large, massive things, general relativity. Try to build large-scale equations of gravity, for example, with really small phenomena such as quantum fluctuations of atomic nuclei, and you get nonsensical mathematical answers such as the answer is x divided by zero. Virtually all present-day reality modeling equations break down at singularity events such as black holes, too. The standard model is seriously lacking, in other words, and one of the reasons there is so much excitement about the Higgs boson is because it would help fill in the gaps of the standard model explanation. All right, now let me stop and comment there what he's getting at. That little, that little pun or that little joke about when you meld general relativity with quantum mechanics, you get equations with absurd results like x divided by zero. Well, everybody knows if you divide anything by zero, you end up with an infinity. And when physicists encounter this, this happens all the time, all right? And they get rid of these infinities through a technique that they call renormalization. All right, that's their fancy word for when we come up with an absurd mathematical result, we normalize it. In other words, we deliberately cook the books is, is what's going on to get a, a, an acceptable result. All right, now, philosophically, not getting into the science part of this here, but philosophically, I want you to note what's going on. Because what this means is is if their equations are telling them certain things about the activity and behavior of particles, and on that basis they're making predictions, why all of a sudden are they throwing out infinities when, they, when those equations pop up? So in other words, it's a very, very dubious selective enterprise that they're engaged on. Maybe those infinities are trying to tell them something, but they don't have any good way of dealing with those infinities, so they, quote, renormalize them, all right? That's a deeply, deeply, and, and physicists would appreciate perhaps what I'm trying to get at there in terms of, of the philosophical issue, because it's a deeply, deeply philosophical issue, all right? But now let's come to the nub, all right, of this article. As I hinted above, there's something missing from all this consciousness. Without consciousness, the universe cannot be fully explained, as consciousness is increasingly emerging as a fundamental force impacting the very fabric of reality. This is really, really frustrating for many scientists because, for starters, the majority of them don't even believe in the existence of consciousness. Stephen Hawking is famous for his rather short-sighted remarks that people are mindless, soulless beings, biological robots, and that religions and spirituality is a realm for people who are afraid of the dark. He titles chapters of his book, The Theory of Everything, and yet does not even acknowledge the existence of consciousness or free will. Two things 
that are fundamentally tied to quantum theory equations in the context of the observer. It goes without saying that until modern day physicists can embrace an attempt to understand consciousness and the role of the observer in shaping the physical universe, even their most determined efforts to find a unified theory of everything will come up short. This is frustrating for physicists because to date, listen carefully, to date, there are no equations that discuss the behavior or properties of consciousness. Although consciousness can be experienced firsthand by conscious beings, it so far has defied measurement and experimental validation. How can anyone prove consciousness exists other than the fact that it is self-evident that those who possess it, is there an independent way to measure it and thereby confirm its existence? Unquote. Now, that's what I want to comment on, because that is, as far as I am concerned, the real hole, not only in the physical sciences, but quite frankly, in all the sciences. And as this author of this article has averred, there are no equations telling us how consciousness works. All right. Now, in the members area on my website, I have written a few papers about something I'm calling analogical calculus, because this is a topic that began to interest me almost 35 years ago, and I began thinking about thinking, and how would we model in a formally explicit type of mathematical language the operations and functions of consciousness, number one. And number two, how would we show from that language how would we map that language to the language of mathematics that physicists use? In other words, would it be a language that we can point in the direction of the types of mathematical languages that is common currency in theoretical physics? Things like the tensor calculus, spinners, and so, Lie algebras, and so on and so forth. So the first thing and I've made some stabs at this, and those of you who've read my books like The Giza Death Star Destroyed with that appendix to Chapter 9, that's where I first put part of this idea out there in public many, many years after I'd started thinking about it privately. Again, I, I, I'm calling this the topological metaphor of the medium, and I have very deliberately suggested that if you look at certain aspects of ancient philosophical literature and try to describe what they're saying in terms of the formal conventions of topology, you get some very interesting results. And part of those results suggest to me that the ancients had such a mathematical language, a unified view of the physical medium and of consciousness because for the ancients it was two sides of the same coin. So what am I really trying to say here? I'm trying to say that so long as physicists are looking at their equations or philosophically engaged in the process of trying to quantize everything and to avoid those nasty infinities and renormalize them, then they are missing a profound clue as to the nature of consciousness and its possible relationship to their discipline. So in other words, what I'm suggesting is that any such formal language would have to be a language that quantization or arithmetic calculability is a subset of a wider, much broader set of algorithmic functions that may not necessarily calculate to a numerical value. All right? This is the way that all people think. If you stop and think about it, every human being learns something by going from the known context to the unknown. And therefore, every human being thinks analogically. In fact, we all have the ability to say that someone's analogy is either apt or inept, and yet no one has sat down to describe why we have the ability to say an analogy is inept or apt. In other words, we have an innate sense 
of what works analogically. Can that be formally specified? Well, in my opinion, yes, it can be. This is part of the what I think is going to be the quest now in the 21st century. Scientists are going to have to come to grips with consciousness in the same way that Noam Chomsky was grappling with it in terms of linguistics, all right? That's why, incidentally, for those of you who are familiar with formal linguistic calculus, will observe that there are aspects of that calculus in the kind of notation that you see in some of my books, all right? There are aspects of it. I haven't told anybody why those particular peculiar little things are there, but if you know linguistic calculus, you'll be able, I think, to figure out why I've put the equations in the way I've put them, because not all functions are arithmetical. Some functions are linguistic. Let's remember something that the ancients said, both in the Bible, in the Vedas, and so on. The first beginning thing was a sound. It was a word, all right? It was, in other words, so to speak, a grammar, all right? So we have, in my view, the way forward now for physics and consciousness is we have to come up with something that is going to be able to handle with equal flexibility and ease mathematical conceptions and linguistic conceptions. Ultimately, I think this is going to lead us into the mathematical language or discipline of topology. Aspects of that, and that's why I've chosen topology as the basis by which I'm expressing ancient metaphysical concepts. Topology, I think, is going to become one of the key central mathematical disciplines. Not to say that it wasn't throughout the 20, uh, throughout the 20th century, particularly in the late 20th century, as mathematicians and physicists began to realize that the more they probed the standard model, the more they had to be reliant upon higher dimensional mathematical languages like topology, which in a certain sense is a language that mathematical geometrical language that can work in any number of dimensions, all right? I think this is the other clue here. So this was a very interesting article to me because I think it raised all the appropriate issues. The Higgs boson is therefore a tiny, in a certain sense, a tiny little part of the story. It's raising a lot of big, huge philosophical implications, and that's what we need to be discussing now in the, and in the coming years in science. Anyway, I've gone a little bit over time, folks. Uh, I apologize for having such a technical news and views from the Nefarium, but uh, I wanted to share these thoughts, get them out there. Uh, perhaps some of you have your own thoughts. I'd, I'd like to hear them. Anyway, bye-bye, everybody, and we'll see you on the flip side. Bye-bye.